Welcome, everyone, to another edition of The Writer's Room. I'm your host, Christopher Paolini, as always, and today uh, I have the pleasure to be talking with Howard Taylor. Howard Taylor, in case you aren't aware, is the author of the long-running webcomic Schlock Mercenary. Howard, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Christopher. This is, uh, this is fun. Well, why don't you tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and uh, about your webcomic as well, because you're one of the few people I've talked to who is both a writer and an illustrator, as you both write and draw Schlock Mercenary. Um, okay, well, I've, I've loved science fiction and fantasy my whole life. I've been embedded in the genre uh, ever since, In I say my whole life. Okay, fifth grade, my parents handed me... Uh, uh, the first official paperback edition of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, which I destroyed because, you know, fifth grader carrying the book to school. Um, loved it. And from there I consumed uh, fantasy novel, fantasy novel uh, and then discovered Nivum's work and plowed into science fiction. And that's been a, uh, that has been a constant feed throughout my life, a constant IV drip of uh, of genre fiction. Um, I studied music in college uh, and then went on to get a job in the technology field doing uh, doing tech support and then eventually doing uh, management for the product, for an email product. Uh, and I quit that job in 2004 to be a web cartoonist full time because Schlock Mercenary had enough readers. It had been running then for about four years. Uh, it had enough readers that we thought, you know, maybe it could sustain us. And that has been my day job since 2004. Uh, Schlock Mercenary is a science fiction comic strip that runs like a newspaper comic, uh, you know, four panels, one, two, three, four. Um, and with, a, you know, the fourth panel being a punchline. And, uh, and yet the whole thing tells a story that's so big my hands don't fit on the screen. I actually uh, first encountered Schlock Mercenary uh, end of last year when I was uh, traveling overseas. And I, as I told you when we met in person, I got a chance to, uh, <laughs> having had a few few free days, I sat down and I read the entire backlog, all the archives from start to finish. You have published a strip, as far as I know, daily, every single day since it debuted, what, July 2000? It was June twelfth of two thousand, and yes, the strip, the strip has updated every day. There has been a strip every day without fail on that day since June twelfth of two thousand. And I do this not by making a comic every day because that way lies madness. I work, I work weeks ahead, and I work in batches. But it's often said that um, consistency and persistence are some of the most important traits that any artist can have. So I'm curious, you know, how have you managed to do this and and stay sane and stay creative, stay productive? I mean, I think we can all think of quite a few web comics uh, who have not been able to maintain a steady pace and burn out or other things pop up in their lives and they just can't keep doing it. So how have you managed that? Failure in other fields. <laughs> um as a music major, I studied music composition, and I was I was king of the earworm. My roommates hated me because I could put together, you know, these quick little melodic things that uh, that just you know they earwormed you, uh, and worse still, they didn't have words, and so you couldn't sing. You're just humming, um, and I would work these into compositions that were maybe two and a half minutes long. And my instructors kept telling me, yes, that's nice. Now, now do some variations. Now explore it. Now pull it apart and, and really dig into it. And, uh, and at first, I just did not know what they meant. Uh, and by the time I knew what they meant, um, I, I had discovered that I didn't want to do that because I didn't find that interesting. What I wanted to do is come up with another melody. Um, and so uh, so the idea of coming up with a project, working on it until you get bored, and then abandoning it and working on another project was something that I did from the ages of you know 18 to 25, which not coincidentally is the age at which a lot of web cartoonists get their start and their stop. Um, 
uh, if, you know, if we were talking, if we were having a podcast, if you were having a podcast with a successful musician, um, I would be one of his cemetery cases. You know, I'm one of the headstones in the cemetery of the guy who, who failed as a musician. Um, but I learned from that. Uh, and, and when I began Schlock Mercenary, I began it with the understanding that it was something that was going to be big. It was something that was going to require advanced planning. And that while I couldn't see the whole story or even a big story in my head when I started, I had confidence that I would be able to figure that out because it was a thing that other people did. You know, it's, oh, you, people write big science fiction novels all the time. Okay, there must be a way in which they do this. I will just start creating this comic strip and, and the pace is slow enough that I'll figure it out. And I figured it out. So, or at least I seem to have figured it out um, 16 years later. So how much world building did you actually do before you started, before you wrote the first strip? And then how much have you done as you went along? I mean, to build on that, <laughs> to, to build on the world building, you know, like, I mean, w with science fiction, the technology and of course the, the future history is usually the biggest example of where your energies end up going. Whereas in fantasy, it tends to be your system of magic, any gods or goddesses you have, and that sort of thing. Immeasurably small, less than 1% of my world building went on before I launched the strip. Uh, a huge amount of world building began in 2002 when I, uh, I was working on the Terraport Wars storyline, which was the point at which I discovered, discovered um, that the, uh, the Terraport which had been, you know, a big deal for the mercenary company in the first year of the strip, was problematic not just because it upset a monopoly, but because the monopoly, the gatekeepers and the worm gates were being used to copy people down to the quantum level. You know, a, a uh, don't get physics in this at all. You know, but a, a you know a quantum level split so you could have a gate clone who you could interrogate and then dispose of, and nobody was the wiser. And, uh, and when, I, when I put that together, uh, I suddenly had to start writing galactic history in, in multiple directions, uh, and, and I've been doing that kind of thing, that kind of thing ever since. A lot of the, a lot of the world building grows out of punchlines. Um, in the first year of the strip, uh, I made a joke about, in a footnote, I made a joke about uplift um, and and said, you know, we've uplifted lots and lots of creatures. And the uh, the one thing everybody agrees on is that uplifting the, Af the African elephant was a mistake. For those, who, for the viewers who might not be familiar with the term uplift, it means... The genetic modification of a life form so that it goes from being uh, sentient you know, cats and dogs are sentient to being sapient, to being uh, not just uh, not just thinking creatures, but fully self-aware uh, savants like like Homo sapiens. Um, and and the the joke with the African elephant was there again. Bull African elephants have terrible, terrible tempers. Terrible, terrible tempers. They're they are by far the deadliest creature to man on the savannas because the lion can't eat you when you're in your jeep. The bull African elephant can pound your jeep flat. Uh, and, and so, I mean, it was a footnote. It was a joke. I laughed at it. People laughed at it. And the, the fan mail and the forum posts uh, flooded in saying, how come there aren't any elephants in the comic? Because I don't know how to draw an elephant. Why would I teach myself to draw an elephant? I'm, I'm just now figuring out how to draw people. So, uh, so I then put elephants in the comic. And uh, I ended up doing a storyline in, uh, uh, I think it was book 11, Massively Parallel, where a portion of the story had a brawl between a sapient, uplifted, uh, a, a neophant, and five baseline African elephants all of which had been infected with something to make them angry. And as a cartoonist, um, I really, really hate my writer self 
for putting that story together. Uh, not because it's not fun to draw things like that, but because when you have six elephants fighting and there's three human beings in the picture, I can't get all the facial expressions. It's where do I put the camera? I'm, you know, I'm not going to draw it. I'm not going to draw it huge because there's no time. Um, so, yeah, back to the world building question. A lot of it's been sloppy and haphazard and has created huge problems for me. Um, but, I mean, therein lies, you know, the challenge and half the fun. How can I make this? How can I make this so it actually works? Well, and you haven't stopped with elephants either. I know you have the sentient polar bear and among others. And maybe it's just me, but I love that kind of humor and and you know, development of the world. It's actually, it, it reminds me very much of some of the things that uh, uh, Ian Banks did in some of his books. You know, these little, sometimes almost throwaway lines that would suggest an entire history or storyline that um, really brings the world to life. So is there, was there anything specifically that inspired Schlock Mercenary? Was there like a book or a movie or something that you read and you thought, yeah, you know, I want to... I want to do something along those lines, or I want to comment on the subject material, or was it just general inspiration? I had tried in, oh, how old was I? 10th grade? 9th grade? I tried writing something like what Douglas Adams had been writing. Okay, I tried writing funny science fiction, and it fell flat. I tried writing science fiction um, in in college and was never any good at it. And then in 1999, I discovered the comic strip, the web comic Sluggy Freelance, and I read through the whole archive. I love Sluggy Freelance, but my takeaway from it was this looks like a really great way to tell a story, and you don't appear to have to know how to draw. Pete. I'm sorry, I've, I've told this story before. I was wrong. <laughs> you do know how, you do have to know how to draw. Uh, yeah, Pete Abrams, Pete Abrams did, you know, what I did what I wanted to do before I knew I wanted to do it. And so I thought, well, I should create a comic strip, um, but I don't want it to be a slice of life wacky thing. I want it to be science fiction, and I want it to be science fiction where I'm not making fun of science fiction. But when I'm making jokes, they're they're character jokes. I'm not gonna. I, you you can't build a comic that is all Star Wars jokes and Star Trek jokes. Um, so the question, uh, you know, what inspired Schlock Mercenary? It was not inspired by story. It was inspired by medium. I thought I had discovered a medium where it would be easier for me to tell a story than it would be otherwise. Um, I was wrong. I discovered a medium in which it was easier for me, not for everybody, but for me to monetize what I was creating and to turn it into a job. I think that's right. I mean, if you can't support yourself from your art, you know, then you have to do something else. And being able to support yourself from the art and your family is one of the most important things that any artist can do. And it also is an indication, a very concrete indication, that you are successfully communicating with an audience. Um, regar regardless of any sort of, you know, quality necessarily, you are communicating, and that in and of itself is an accomplishment and is a talent and is not something that everyone can do. When we, when we sing, we want people to listen. When we speak, we want people to hear and to understand. When we write, we want people to read. When we paint, we want people to pause and to look and to, and to drink it in. Um, and... And that's that's the creative that's the creative mindset. Uh, there's um, there's unkind ways to describe you know that sort of attention seeking, um, but but the act of creation so that other people can consume it is not unhealthy at all. It's I think it's what makes humans so wonderful. It's it's a basic act of communication. That's how I look at it. It really is. Well, so we've we've talked about the writing, but we haven't really talked about the art very much. So I'm curious, were you were you an artist before the strip? And obviously your art has evolved as you've <laughs> as you've drawn it over the years. So let let's talk about that a bit. I was very much not an artist. I took one drawing class in college 
none of that translated into drawn comics. None of it. When I started drawing Schlock Mercenary, uh, I really was a poster child for the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, the Dunning-Kruger effect uh, essentially says uh, when you are inexpert, truly inexpert in a given domain, you are, and now I'm going to paraphrase, too dumb to know how dumb you are. You can't even comprehend how badly you suck. Um, and for me, it was, it was an absolute blessing that I didn't discover how bad the art was until, until I had enough confidence and enough audience consuming the bad art that I could shrug and say, eh, I got paid. I guess I'll just learn to do better. And, um, and I think that's good advice for, for any artist, uh, or any writer. I think it was William, William Henry was the one who said, uh, you have to write a million words before you've written your first true word. Um, and it gets quoted a lot. And, uh, and I can't remember the name of the guy who said, look, if your first million words are practice, that's fine. If you get paid for some of your first million, pra first million words, go ahead and practice cashing checks by cashing those checks. Uh, and, and so, yeah, the art, the art has, has grown a lot. Is there anything you know now that you wish you had known when you were starting out? So that, that's tricky because, as I said earlier, the, the whole poster child for Dunning-Kruger, if I'd known at the beginning how much I needed to learn, I probably would have punted. I probably would have said, oh, this isn't for me. You know, I, I can't possibly do that. Um, if I had known, uh, if I'd known how difficult the, the 18 months between quitting the day job and getting the first book into print were going to be, um, I, I don't know that, I don't know that I could have done that. Um, if I'd known that, you know, for the first four years I was working on the comic when I was doing the comic and doing a 60 hour a week day job, um, if I'd known how difficult that was going to be. I, I wouldn't have signed up for it. Uh, and so to a large extent, the most important lessons I've learned, I'm very glad that I, I learned them. I learned them ahead of having done the hard part. I can't think of a lesson that I've learned that would have saved me. It would have saved me a whole bunch of time. I think, I think your answer about, not knowing how much work it was going to require. I know that's certainly been true in my case as well. If I'd known how much work each book was going to require, you know what? There are video games that I prefer playing. <laughs> there, there, there's, you know, time I could be spending with my family. There, there are trails I could be hiking. There are books I could be reading, movies I could be watching. But that said, I'm glad I did what I did. But if I'd known going into it how difficult it was going to be, it would have been very hard to take that first step. I wish I had known sooner that I have an actual diagnosable mental health condition. Um, not, and you know, the, the, the self-medication, the cognitive techniques that I learned on my own because I assumed that was just how people got by in the world. Um, I'm glad that I have those, but I think that I would have been more aggressive about learning them and committing to them if I'd been told, you know, your brain does, in point of fact, work differently than baseline uh, human brain. Um, here, are some, here are some coping strategies that you will need. Uh, baseline people, um, there's no such thing really as a baseline people, uh, but these strategies are also useful here, uh, but you really need them. I think mental health strategies are incredibly important for people in creative professions to learn because um, for whatever reason, you know, whether it's the nature of the creative process or the types of people who tend to be drawn to it, it does seem to either exacerbate or attract people who sometimes have issues that need, you know, they, they need to deal with. And sometimes sitting alone in your room working on one project for years at a time does not help whatever that issue happens to be.
Or conversely, going out and speaking with a few thousand people at a convention. That can be the other side of things. I am an introvert with a solid suite of extrovert skills. Um, I recharge in a quiet room at home, uh, not interacting with people. There are people who recharge at parties where they are surrounded by other folks and being alone drains them. Um, that's, uh, that's part of it for me. A larger part was uh, the, the realization that um, I wanted to laugh and I wanted people to laugh because that healed me. And, uh, and so funny was just something that I had to do. So, so one last big question then. Um, what advice would you give to someone who is starting out in your field nowadays? I really love the last verse of Jonathan Colton's song, A Talk with George. And uh, the, song, the song is about the life of a guy who uh, had money, went ahead and did crazy things and, and ambitious things when he didn't have to. He could have just lived luxuriously. Uh, and every so often when I'm feeling down, I listen to that because it reminds me that failing and learning and trying are all things that I should be able to take joy from and that the voice that I have that, that I want to hear and that I want other people to hear uh, is, is a, is a sacred trust. It's a thing that it's, it's a thing that is precious to me. And if I don't let it out, if I don't try and speak, uh, I have failed in a way that is, is not fun. So that was really deep and heady. Go listen to the song. A Talk with George by Jonathan Cole. Beautiful piece of music. I think that's a wonderful answer. So I, I, if it hasn't been clear throughout this interview yet, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed Schlock Mercenary and I very much recommend it to our, our viewers. Thank you, Christopher. I've had, a, I've had a great time. My pleasure. And thank you again, everyone, for watching the interview. I hope you come back and check out the next one uh, whenever it comes up. Thank you again.